Well, welcome everybody. Uh, yes, I'm going to talk about unified modeling language. And um, I know this is a system engineering group. Uh, I am going to talk mostly from the point of view of UML, but I am going to try to have an example that relates it a bit to system engineering and why. What I'm going to talk about is useful for system engineering, even though I'm not going to talk specifically about uh, SysML, the uh, system engineering modeling language. So, uh, one of the things I was asked to specifically address in this talk was the idea of UML as a modeling language with meaning, with semantics behind it. To a lot of extent, people don't realize that there are semantics behind UML, and the reason for that is that there haven't always been clear semantics behind UML. It's been an interesting journey, so I'm going to have to take you to a little bit of a trip here on where UML came from, why we are where we are today, and where we're going, which is places that people may not realize UML is being taken. So from UML being just drawing pictures to UML being a way to generate code, to UML actually having an executable semantics, which is why I called the talk once more with me. We're finally getting UML to mean something other than just having fancy drawing tools. So let's look at the prehistory of UML. I'm going to go back quite a few years here. Um, I, I, I see both some students and some um, more uh, accomplished researchers, let us say, um, some of whom may remember back to the 1980s. Uh, the 1980s was when really object oriented analysis and design techniques started to solidify. Now, object oriented programming had been around longer than that. But the idea of having actual OAD methodologies really started to come to the forefront in the 1980s. The basic idea that when you developed software programs, you wanted to organize those programs um, around a model of basic concepts in the problem domain. So your programs themselves reflected the uh, problem domain in which your program solution was taking place. And the problem with this was that programming languages, most programming languages, most mainstream programming languages, even object-oriented programming languages, aren't really good at being problem domain modeling languages, which led almost everybody in the 80s to invent some sort of pictorial way to represent things that aren't presented well in code. So, you know, a program has to execute, you have to deal with the implementation details, our programming languages, to a large extent, they'll abstract up from uh, hard basic bundling and hardware abstractions. Um, and you lose, when you start putting the code together of a big program, you tend to lose the big picture of the design and the architecture and the structure. And that's hard to recapture just by looking at the code. So the solution to this was to use a graphical modeling notation, usually in two ways, the A and the D. Uh, to model the problem domain during analysis and then to model the solution during design. And the solution model then became the blueprint for coding. And that led to the basic idea of your model in software being a model of the program you're trying to create. And in fact, that became more common, even though you could model the problem domain and use it to mean something about the problem domain. Really, it was a way to get to writing code. Um, and, and the consequence was, in the software community at least, really the predominant, entirely everyone with the predominant viewpoint was that models are really pictures. They're just, they're pictures that you use as a way to get your thoughts together to blueprint actually writing the code. And the real meaning was to be found in the programs themselves because that's what's executed, that's what actually did whatever you wanted done, and everything else are just a means to get that done. Um, so we really came out of the 80s into the 90s with a bunch of these. All right, and, and uh, you know, some of the major ones are the well-known Booch, Rumbaugh, and Jakobsen. Um, you are Jakobsen, I just started working at his latest company. Um, but there was, a, there was a whole bunch of notations coming out of the 90s for how to represent the structure of programs, how to represent designs in order to hand it to somebody who might not be the designer to actually uh, code this on, on larger teams. There was a, tended to be then a separation between analysts and designers and coders. So in, in 1995, uh, really a little bit earlier than that, Booch was the first one to look at this and say, look, we have a lot of people who have all this sort of graphical modeling approaches to do the same thing in different ways, all with an OO background. Um, and he started proposing to reunify these things. And by 1995, he had teamed up with Jim Rumbaugh and Ivar Jakobsen. They were known as the three amigos at the time 
at uh, Rational Software Corporation before it was bought by IBM. And they proposed a unified modeling language. Unified in the sense that it was trying to unify the various object-oriented analysis and design graphical modeling languages that were now in, in relatively wide use in the 1990s. Um, this was proposed for standardization by Rational in 1996 as UML 1.0 and was adopted by the Object Management Group, OMG, um, which I don't know if people are familiar with the OMG, but it's, it's an industry consortium that started to do uh, distributed object standards with the uh, CORBA, the Common Object Request Broker Architecture, um, and UML was really their first foray into expanding beyond that to um, standardization, modeling standardization, which is now central to what OMG, uh, OMG's approach, model-driven architecture. But it really started here in 1996, 97, um, with the adoption of UML by the OMG. The standardization here was primarily to allow the syntactic interchange of models between tools. It's interesting, in the RFP, the request for proposals that actually led to UML being adopted by OMG actually wasn't asking for a standard notation. It was asking for a standard underlying representation of models that could be interchanged by tools. It turned out it took much longer for the OMG to actually achieve that. Um, and what really came out of that RFP was uh, common notation that has now become arguably widely used by even, even programmers I've found who don't believe in model-driven approaches anymore and certainly are much more agile in the way they go about development teaming still know how to draw a class diagram or a sequence diagram or a state chart diagram that has just become sort of a natural underpinning uh, in a lot of our profession. But it all started here um, with really this first standard being adopted. But it was primarily syntactic. Uh, even though there was a description of the semantics in there, it was really focused on the idea of surface notation and underlying interchange of syntax between modeling tools. So we move forward then to UML2. Um, you know, almost immediately after UML1 was adopted, there was a request for information that went out of OMG about saying, all right, now we've adopted UML. This is, this is 99, so it's, it's, it was relatively early. It was a year or two later. What about moving beyond UML1? What would we like in UML2 now that we've got a little experience with using UML? Um, actual RFPs went out in 2000. Uh, in 2003, UML2.0 was adopted. And you notice it took a while to get there. Um, and it wasn't finalized for another two years. Um, we are now. Many years later, in 2011, we adopted the latest formal version, which is UML 2.4.1. So work beyond that, I'll get to in a moment, but that's the current uh, formal version of UML. Really, and I remember some of the uh, discussion around the people who replied to the request for information. There was a lot of interest in adding semantic interoperability to UML. So there was the idea that the UML 1 standard provided a basis for syntactic interchange of models between tools is more than just pictures, but having an underlying meta model representation and the ability to interchange the model information. But it wasn't clear that there was any semantic in our problem, that the tools understood the meaning of these models in the same way because the models, again, we were still based on the idea that this was modeling software. And if you did a UML model of C versus a UML model, by this time Java had started coming in, of Java or C++ or Fortran, um, they really meant different things because the underlying semantics of those languages wasn't the same. And there was a lot of argument about how you represented things from different languages and how what it said in the, OMG, in the UML standard, what it meant in terms of the languages. Um, and a lot of tool vendors focused specifically on specific markets and generating code in specific markets and of course didn't want to give up how they did things, how they went from UML and helped you actually code from that. Um, so unfortunately, any hope for semantic interoperability in UML 2.0 really fell to the wayside and in a lot of ways UML 2.0 really is an example of the second version effect where um, instead of sort of moving beyond what UML 1 was about, it was sort of like UML 1, only more so, with more functionality, more stuff in there, more complexity. 
Um, and in fact, I have a quote here that was in the UML superstructure specification from 2.0 all the way through 2.4.1. Basically, as a standard, there's compliance points saying how a tool can show that it's conforming to the standard. Um, there is no, from 2.0 to 2.4.1, no conformance point in UML for semantics. So despite the fact there's a lot of text in the UML standard about the meaning of UML models, there is no formal need for a tool to conform to any of that. No way to them even claim formal standards conformance to any of that through 2.4.1. And the explanation was is that because of the presence of numerous variation points in these semantics in UML, and the fact that they are defined informally using natural language, it's impractical to define this as a formal compliance type since the number of possible combinations is very large. And why was that? Because every tool vendor that contributed to this standard, who did things in a certain way, wanted to make sure that they could still say we're conformant to UML, even though one generated C, the other generated Java, the other maybe did some analysis simulation. So they put that all on the standard. And if you looked at every possible way and every possible semantic variation, they said there's no way to conform to it. Which is a pretty, you know, it's pretty clear from this that the idea that UML has no formal semantics, no formal meaning to the models is, well, it says so there in the standard itself. So, so what was meant by conformal? Pardon? Uh, so there, there what were- was meant because we have been in this for 25 years and I never understood what it was meant that uh, a tool is conformant. There, right, there are three, three it kinds of- It was never defined to my satisfaction. It was never formal, it, was, it could never be checked. Because it, it was a contradiction in its own way of writing, as the statement says. For semantics. So there were three. For conformance compliance. What conformance compliance? There are three. The tool. Right. Three what points. What was meant by, by ONG right. for conformance compliance? Three points. Uh, there, as I mentioned, there, we're working on there's five now, but there were three. There was concrete syntax, abstract syntax, and interchange, basically. All right. So it's, it's a tool conforms if it can draw pictures that look like the UML notation. It can, it can conform if underneath it can represent that using an abstract syntax, and it can conform if it can then interchange that using XMI, UML 2.4, it was clear by that time, using XML uh, metamodel interchange if it can interchange with another tool. How do you check that? You're right, OMG is not, an, it, this is interesting, because OMG and, and there's, whole, there's actually antitrust reason, antitrust reasons why they're not in the business, of actually enforcing conformance to their own standards. However, there is a group that's grown up over the last say, three, four years now, the Model Interchange Working Group at OMG. Um, and so there's now actually a test suite of tests um, that no, they can, time, but those days, I mean, even, even when people were talking about metamodal compliance, and, and that was not even defined. What, what, what you meant by metamodal compliance? Yes. And not even within the bounded context. Yep. The, the conformance and compliance statements through UML 2.4.1 were very confusing, um, especially in UML 2. They were very, because UML 1, the whole idea of how OMG standards work for modeling wasn't clear. By UML 2, it should have been clear. And what they said was, again, very loose, intentional, because the vendors didn't want to be locked down. And that's a real problem. Um, as you'll see, I mean, in UML 2.5, there has been an attempt to make it clear what that means. And I can actually bring up, I, I wasn't going to go into all the other conformance, um, but the idea is to be clear, but still in the base UML 2.5, not restrictive. If you'll see in the executable UML, there's actually a several pages and a much more formal definition of what conformance means. Um, and I can talk more about that. Um, uh, I, I don't have all the details here, but I can bring up the details of exactly how. So a lot of thought that has been given to that since this. So this is where we were as of 2011. Now, though, in the meantime, another thread was going on. So another thread had been going on to say, you know, we can't keep going this way. A lot of effort had been put into going from UML 2.0 to 2.4.1, just trying to deal with the specification, with the complexity of the specification, um, with the lack of precision of the specification. It was finally decided that it was like a program that you kept trying to patch. You patched one area and you didn't realize that that had implications in another area, and somebody would complain that you're messing something up here. Basically, we have to say, let's stop. 
let's stop and in modern terminology, let's refactor the specification. We're not going to change the functionality of UML. We're going to leave that the same, but what we're going to do is completely rewrite the specification, simplify the meta model um, presentation, simplify the discussion. That led to UML 2.5. That really came out of, in 2008, a request for information about what should be the future of, of UML. Um, there was a lot of good tooling coming out in UML. There was uh, now starting to achieve actual model interchange, but because of this imprecision and because of some of the questions that are being brought up here, outside of the modeling community that has sort of adopted the model-driven approach, UML had actually lost ground because people looked at this and said, I can't get into this, I can't understand it. Um, what does it mean? <laughs> you know. Um, so there was a discussion about where do we go with UML? Is it time for UML 3.0 or do we need but what we can hardly even tell what's wrong with what we have now. So as a foundation, one of the things that came out of this was the idea of, in order to figure out where we're going to go with UML, first we have to make it clear where we are right now. So let's rewrite the UML specification, not just a revision, even though we call it UML 2.5. There was a new request for proposal, and start it over. Now, some text and some pieces were taken from these things. That foundation is defined, actually it is metacircular, so foundational UML is actually defined using an operational semantics in the sense it has an interpreter that is itself written in foundational UML. Um, just I'm an old list hand, so it was very natural for me to suggest writing um, the interpreter in the language itself, but of course that's circular. So at some point you need to ground it, um, and there's a base semantics, so actually foundational UML Interpreter is written in base UML, which is a subset of foundational UML, which has declarative um, formal logic base semantics. Now that's something that a few people have started looking at. I know at universities, I'd like to see more about being able to have declarative proofs based on this that basically shine through the operational semantics so you can actually do declarative or uh, formal mathematical analysis of UML programs based on this. Hasn't gotten that far. Most of industry is focusing on just the operational semantics and executing. Um, but, but there is the formal uh, underlying logic. Um, the key components, as I said, is there's a computationally complete subset of Turing complete subset of UML. Uh, so it is, in effect, a complete programming language. Uh, the basic kernel has basic object capabilities. There's general behavior and common behavior. And it is a fundamentally asynchronous model. So that's the interesting thing, and I've got a whole other presentation about this, is that you, the underlying execution model for UML in terms of activities is really a token-based data flow model that is inherently concurrent um, and provides intentionally, as we define the subset here, it was intentionally at the minimum amount of enforced, of, of um, unnecessary sequentialization. You can make things sequential. And this really comes from the Schleyer-Meller experience of the idea that if you want the maximum flexibility in going to various target architectures, you want to impose as little as possible. Um, if you look at what's going on with Java, as they try to add more concurrency into Java on a very poor, top of a very poor threading model, um, it's really tough because Java is an inherently sequential, by Neumann stack-based, stack heap based language, as most languages are. That's why you see interest in functional programming languages, because they're not based on that model, but most programmers have a lot of trouble dealing with those because they think in state. Um, the problem is, is that our languages build in a lot of synchronization. One second, I'm gonna just finish up here. The execution model, as I mentioned, that is the interpreter written in FUML itself. Um, and then there's a foundational model library, which is just a very basic library. One of the things like Java, one of the things that UML needs to actually support this is more model libraries. And the whole idea of being able to do model libraries and tie them into this, I think is very important. And we're only very little ways along that. Foundational UML itself basically just has primitive types, some very primitive behaviors to deal with things like arithmetic and string manipulation, and very basic input output, really just the basic idea that you can have a channel where you can send stuff from, into and out of an executing model. So OMD is supporting the and development and Yes. Uh, I will get, there, there is one more step that's already been made. That the, within the OMG process, what you would do is you'd need to have uh, an RFP come out. 
and, and I'm, I'm not going to do it. So, so you basically have to have an RFP coming. Now, anybody can do it, right? And there's actually also an RFC process. So if somebody actually creates a law library and says to OMG, I've got this done, you can actually ask the OMG membership to accept that. I mean, you're both members of OMG, right? Yes. So Companies are members of OMG. So we're both members of OMG. I'm not uh, directly right. or only directly. So the question is natural enough for me. Why isn't OMG adopting, if this is uh, as promised, a, a, a simpler structure where people can contribute to the user? That, that, that's a whole issue with the OMG structure. And there's a lot of issues with OMG being a nonprofit, uh, exempt. There's a whole issue around legality of consortium, which I'm not an expert in. So. OMG is better than most, actually, and faster than most standard organizations, which is a little scary. Yeah. Sorry. What have events fit into the foundational model library? Pardon? What does the notion of event figure into the, so if you want to do sort of event-based program yeah, or event-based um, modeling, or, you know, state machines also have events. Right. Like, this so. is a, uh, let me be very careful here, all right, because event is used in different ways, and it has a very specific meaning within the OMG language, the UML language. So in UML, there is actually a construct called an event. Uh, it is really a type, all right? So in UML, an event is, is a specification, and the, the, the instances of that in the set is specifies occurrences. So some people treat the occurrences as an event. In UMG, it's an event occurring. In UML, technically, it's an event occurring. That basic idea of events and occurrences of events are part of the common behavior moniker. All right, so that's actually in base UML, the idea that you can, you can do that. So you can model events, you can model um, signals, which are complete asynchronous transmission. So that's another thing people sometimes call events. UML separates the idea of a signal, which is an asynchronous transmission. Um, and there is the event of sending that, the event of receiving that. And then you can have a signal instance um, and the occurrence of the receipt of that signal interest can trigger processing, like the transition in a state machine. That's all base UML. All right? So there's nothing in the library about that um, because it's all within UML itself. Now, you, FUML doesn't actually have state machines, which is an interesting point. It actually has activities because if you do state machines, you need to like you make a transition or you have, you have some behavior that has to be specified by something else. Um, and ultimately, you get down to needing basic actions in the UML activity model. So you have to have that to do state machines. You don't need to have state machines to do that. So the foundation is to do the activity model. Um, I, I'm surprised that the people who were going, the Harrell legacy people were gonna put in an RFP to do state machines. That still hasn't happened. I think it hasn't happened because they got bought by IBM and IBM is much slower on this stuff. But, but do you know if you're gonna need any more to communicate time with some other things? Uh, yeah. If formally you will need anything more than communicating time to time. Or, um, I mean, it depends on how much modeling you do. If you want to do any plant modeling, then you do need more. I mean, you'll need something besides just time to time. You probably would want something like hybrid automata. But um, if, you're, if the focus is so really on modeling the digital aspects of the system. But in um, time to time, they can have events. Oh, well, they can have events, but they can't model sort of. You know, UML, UML has full state charts. They haven't formalized yet in UML. There's a lot of formalization of them. They're actually not exactly the same as Corel state charts, um, but there has been a lot of work on it. But equation is not the computer problem, it's the classical computer theory. Yeah, but if it's modeling, then, you know. No, no, but I mean this, because there's a bit of debate. They people say stupid right. things. Differential mm -hmm. equation let me, let me, is not a formal model, because now it's everything like classical let's, computer let's, theory, yes or no? Uh, I don't know, it seems pretty formal to me, but I mean, what, what is it? Let's, let's hold this discussion. Yeah. Uh, let, let, let me get through it. There's plenty of things that we can discuss here. But, um, just from the point of view of UML, all right, um, the, the overall structure of an executable UML program, if you take the UML underlying execution model to heart, is a bunch of communicating processes, basically. It's, it's a bunch of uh, communicating activities, or active objects um, that themselves, so there's both these, I was gonna say communicating sequential processes, except they don't have to be sequential. So it's not even well, like- Well, I can go to the uh, of that model again. Okay. Pardon? We can go to the, if we have a model of communicating asynchronous processes, we have for model, so that's- Yes. We go beyond the original acquired model. Right, so, so and, and that is the basic, it, it's not added on top of UML, uh -huh. that is the UML underlying behavioral uh, foundation. 
However, you're still talking about a primarily brand. Remember back in 1998, Steve Miller wanted to have an action language in UML because at a certain point, if you're specifying behavior, trying to do it diagrammatically, there's a lot of studies coming in as far back in the 60s and 70s have showed there's a certain level where drawing diagrams for most people is just a lot harder than writing in text. Certainly with UML notation for activities, trying to draw even just a simple mathematical equation and formalize that executability and draw it as UML activity, which I have done, is just very frustrating, very error prone, very hard to get right, um, just to do simple things. So at that level, it doesn't make sense to do it graphically. There's a point where you want a textual notation, and it's interesting. Finally, by 2008, 10 years later, there was a consensus that, oh, by the way, there's this hole where we don't have a textual surface language. I mean, UML 2.0 actually talked about um, having, I think kind of you originally wrote this, where it talked about actually having a concrete surface language for the action, which is one reason why there isn't full standard graphical notation at the action level for UML. The, the assumption was that eventually there'd be a, a concrete surface textual language. Well, that, finally, the RFP went out in 2008. Um, the beta was adopted in 2010. We had a revision in 2013, even before it became formalized because of um, the move from 1.0 to 1.1. One, one. So this was held up so that there's various timing issues with the standard, but now we basically have out there, just again, waiting for editing. There's a publicly available document for ALF 1.0.1, which is based on FUML 1.1 and UML 2.4.1. And it's actually, um, this is a programming language. It's a programming language based on UML modeling semantics. It can be used in conjunction with graphical modeling, or you can actually do a complete model textually if you want. And then the division, where you want to go graphical and textual, you can move back and forth. Tools are just starting to appear in the UML world to allow that to happen. So, I mean, it's got pretty much like a programming language, and, and the specification is intentionally written much like um, a, a typical programming language reference manual, except the back end is um, the, the formal semantics matched to FUML 1.1 rather than, say, a virtual machine or something. So it's got a concrete syntax, an abstract syntax of its own because mapping it directly to the UML syntax was too big a jump because there was a strong feeling on the submission team that unfortunately it had to look like a C legacy language. Um, so that, which is, I mean, it looks a lot like Java or C++ uh, even though the underlying semantics are quite different. Um, so the underlying semantics are by mapping to FUML. So FUML, in effect, the UML execution engine is a virtual machine for uh, ALF. ALF. ALF stands for Action Language for FUML. Um, but we write it lowercase, like it's uh, the alien life form. Remember the TV show? I still have to talk to OMG to see if we can get the rights to the, uh, the ALF alien to be our mascot. But, um, so here's the next step in the standard model library. So what we did was also have a much more extensive model library going along with ALF. It builds on the foundational model library, but also includes a set of collection functions and collection classes. Um, it actually adds natural and bit string type because the, um, the uh, real time people said you've got to do a bit strings, but it, it tries to abstract that up. Um, so it has an abstract concept of bit string um, rather than just being a representation for integers. Uh, so that's all in that standard. What I wanted to do and we're running up on the hour on this, but I wanted to actually show an example. So that's all the history. Um, but what does this actually look like? What does it actually mean in terms of doing modeling? So since this is supposedly a system engineering group, I took an example that from the SysML. This is a simplification of the hybrid SUV example from the uh, SysML standard. State machines are used a lot, right, in SysML. Now, state machines aren't in foundational UML at this point, but there are places where you need, I mean, there's a lot of tools that will still execute basic state machines, and they're, they're pretty consistent in how they do it. Um, so we've got here a simple case of the operational states for hybrid SUV. You can be off, you start the vehicle, it operates, it's idling, you can accelerate, you can brake. And we've got the various transitions, right? You've got discrete transitions between these things. But while you're in the various states, you actually have behavior that goes on during the state. So while you're in the braking state, it should actually brake. While you're in the accelerating state, the vehicle should actually accelerate. 
So this is a model of an actual vehicle. Now what you want to do is get down another level and actually specify these behaviors, like accelerating and braking. So there's multiple ways you can do that. One way is to specify it directly. Remember, where you want to do this graphically or textually is um, really up to the model. And you can go back and forth between them. In fact, I'm just about hopefully started on a project to, to be able to um, have a tooling that moves back and forth between textual and graphical. But, but, but to this example, I don't know. Yeah, I'll go back to the, uh, to the discussion I got with Grant. Okay, in this example, we just start with these states to see what's happening inside the states. Let's say when I accelerate, there's a differential equation model. There or is a, you, a whole other, other, right. But if you don't like that, okay. All right, so, so Cisco, I, I didn't I actually address that here, but there's a whole other discussion. So there has to be some way right. of describing either hybrid automata or... But you can in Cisco, because Cisco has parametrics. Uh, the, the formalization between the... That's another long story. Well, yeah. Because you're trying there. All right. So, that is not addressed by FUML. So FUML, if you want to do formal equations, you're going to have to set up some sort of integration mechanism and do the, 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 the typical numerical integration, because UML is fundamentally based on, on discrete uh, mathematics. But I've talked to folks, and, and again, if I can, there's only so many things everybody could do, but they're both working on you know, hybrid simulation of continuous and discrete simulation. And the issue is to bring these together within a UML framework. Yeah, but even in this example, you'd have continuous right. Right. Let's put that aside for this point. All right, I, I can do. You can still simulate using whatever techniques you have for, for that. I'm, let's just keep it simple at this point. Okay, that's fine. All right. Um, so here, basically, all right, what I'm saying is that you have to so push the accelerator. You get the vehicle condition, and you provide power. And within providing power, there's going to be some sort of integration. Um, my key point is that this code that looks kind of small here, I don't know if you see it, is looks a lot like Java or something, and, and, and a lot of tools these days it would be Java or C++. That's actually ALF code. That is correct ALF code, it looks like Java, but what it means is pretty much this. Right, so this is a graphical representation of that. Um, it says I'm going to push the accelerator, I'm going to measure vehicle conditions, I'm going to feed that in providing power, I'm going to get drive power out, I'm going to get uh, uh, transmission mode command coming out of it. Um, and that can actually be executed. And it can be executed in an a, in a asynchronous way um, uh, or a synchronous way. But why can I not take it to you? Right? Why do I have to go to this level of trying to use GML when it's not meant to do that? Rather, what I would have done, and what we do actually here when we work in this project, is I take this block that we call the state of acceleration. And replace it by a different language, okay? That will give me exactly this, what, what we call in the name, fourth description, correctly. And, 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 and I'll do just that. The, I'm, you made the claim the UML wasn't intended to do this. No. I'm claiming it was intended to do this. No, actually, I disagree. System out. I disagree with your basic statement here. Okay. Right. You, you, can, you can disagree. I, I disagree. But then let, let's put that aside. Let me finish the example. The UML is primarily, let me say. UML was primarily motivated by software domain. It was never intended for systems of name. And we'll, just, we'll debate that in the afternoon. Yeah, UML 1 was. UML, UML anything. 2. Well, now, the, the people who did UML 2, if you look at the actual, there, there is a schizophrenia about this, depending on who you talk to. But people who were involved in UML 2, and, and SysML came soon after UML 2 to actually include that. But the idea was to be able to model more than software. And it was always the case that it could be in UML 1. UML 2, that was explicitly stated as one of the goals. And they, this well, right. this activity is very close. No, no, but there's a fundamental difficulty, guys, here, okay? There is no notion, okay, of executable continuous time models, all right, that you can put them together with hybrid. Still, we're struggling with that problem. Yes. So, well, how would you well, well, the part of the UML? is actually very close to similar. They're not that yeah. far apart. It's when you get into the. Very close, uh, I understand what you're saying. Very yeah. close is. is Exactly, very close. It will never be exact. Yeah, it's not. It was not the intention. Yeah, but your original point was that they're completely different, but they're not. Right. No, but it was not the intention. I don't understand why we're pushing this direction. Anyway, that's another discussion. So this is this example actually comes from SysML. So you may disagree with SysML, but the people who use SysML, yeah. um, and it is becoming more and more widely used in the system engineering community. 
um, are looking at the ability to execute exactly these kind of models. And, and these sort of data flow models are actually very appropriate. And at this level, the graphical presentation the graph makes a lot of sense. Is no problem. The so, as a graphical representation of capturing the block diagram of the system, the system is fine. But I would never push this ML to be executable when I have hybrid systems. Okay, you don't have to. This is going to be, I predict this is going to be one wall after the other. But um, well, the basic, I have the basic, the basic to look at this area is that yes. hybrid systems is all this software and hardware together. All right. If the Let, software is being modeled. Can I just cut, I, I, I hate to cut off because I, I, I did want to, we're, we're at, at noon, so it's been an hour. Well, we're having a round two today. Right. So I just want to get through the example. The example here, by making it a system engineering example, it brings up other issues, but really what I wanted to show is the relationship right. between the graphical and textual notifications on the executability. The fact that this actually can be executed. Um, and that what I've done here is I've broken down this provide power. All right, so the provide power, this is actually something that calls another activity. This other activity here actually uh, has the detailed actions that sometimes you may not put in. So we're starting to see here that in order to make this fully executable, I need to do things like say, this vehicle condition actually breaks up. I have to break out the speed, break out the battery condition, just because of the way this is structured. That feeds into proportioning the power. Now, this proportioning the power is where a lot of the work goes on. How do I specify that? Again, this is where I copped out because I didn't want to go into some of the detailed discussion. The actual example in, in the SysML a world has to get into the differential equation. But let's keep this really simple um, in terms of a very simple control theory. One thing I can do is say this is what's in UML called an opaque action. It's just a funny name, but it basically means it's not defined within UML, except it is because I'm going to define it in out. So I actually can write this again in text and say the throttle um, is associated with the battery uh, acceleration, the battery condition, etc. So I can have more ALF code in there. What happens to that ALF code? Well, that ALF code actually is equivalent to this model. Now, this is the kind of thing you don't want to have to do by hand. Right? It's kind of ridiculous to be able to have to put you know, uh, a times and a divide and a minimum all by hand and draw this on a diagram. What you want to be able to do is write it this way, even though I'm sure most people can't see the detail. It's actually annotated to be parallel, so this isn't actually sequential. All of these things, just like this, it specifies fully concurrent parallel computation. Um, and in fact, an ALF compiler can take this code, translate it into that, but there is a standard way to maintain the relationship between the code and the model. So I can change the code and this can get recompiled within a larger model. Um, so what we have here is, is basically the ability to do things like mathematical equations, create objects, you know, what, everything you'd want in a language, but the underlying capability maps to this um, undefined data flow architecture. And you could write it completely. I can also do it completely textual. So I can actually, I don't have the full example okay. here, but I can do class diagram, I can do classes, I can do activities, um, all within the textual language. Uh, so this shows the same thing, the same activity specified completely within, within alpha notation. And the goal, ultimately, you're right, is to get us to automated execution and analysis. And you're right, in the software world, where you're not dealing with some of the continuous yeah, simulation yeah. stuff, um, just being able to specify in a language that underneath is model-based, deals with things like bidirectional associations at the structural level, doesn't assume sequentiality at the behavioral level, naturally has a model for concurrent or uh, asynchronous communication. That's a big gain just in the software world. When you get down to SysML, you're right. The goal is ultimately to be able to execute it and actually simulate the system, which means ultimately you're going to have to tie into discrete simulation. Whether you do that by um, using Modelica, using some other simulation tool, which, which are bridges from SysML, um, that's what's being looked at, is how do you tie. And one of the reasons that people from the SysML community, like Conrad, like uh, Sandy Friedenthal, are very involved in the FUML effort is that ultimately you want to build up the foundational semantics of UML and deal with this issue of how do I get these other semantics, whether it's going to be within UML or having a standard link to other languages which you can deal with it. Um, I don't claim that to be a solved problem or my primary area of work right now that I am interested in.
but the goal is model-based system engineering. So the goal is that you can use standard-conforming modeling tools. All right, and you notice I didn't just say UML here or SysML. You want the modeling tools that make sense. And UML and SysML, I believe, have a part in this. But they only have a part in it because now we're actually making them mean something other than just drawing pictures. Um, you want to use standard-based model interchange. So that is something where the OMG community finally has gotten a grip on being able to have interoperable interchange of models between tools, and we can actually test that now and show um, that that works, and the tools have come a long way in the last few years. What you really want is standard performing model execution and simulation tools, where whatever modeling languages you're using here, that you can exchange them between tools, and you can have various tools which actually reflect common semantics, whether that's analytical, execution, Simulation, right now, what I've been talking about with FUML is the execution portion of that. Because ultimately, then, we want to be able to take those models and develop components, soft hardware and software components, that actually provide the running system. Ultimately, for software, you want to see this compiled directly. For hardware, maybe you get it with automated manufacturing and whatnot, or maybe it's another engineering step. Um, but the goal is that you can actually base your decisions on building the actual system on the work you've done here with simulation and execution. So right now, in terms of FUML and ALF, the implementations, there's an open source reference implementation available. It's been available for a while. Um, there are at least two, and I think there may be more, um, commercial implementations. I know there are other, there's, there's uh, an Eclipse implementation that is being worked on um, that I don't think is, is actually released. It should, I think, will be the Kepler release um, of Eclipse. Um, but there's at least two commercial implementations of FUML. The interesting thing is this one's interpretive, and this one actually compiles to C++. Um, this is an ALF, this ALF implementation's here. That's less farther along because it's a relatively new standard, but there's a complete implementation of ALF, except for operation over uh, But everything else is implemented. Um, in this open source reference implementation. Um, if you're gonna look at that, wait a day or two because I need to get another release out that I haven't quite been able to push out yet. Um, so there should be another release coming to that, which is uh, the current one out there is based in FUML 1, not quite 1.1, one, one, um, one zero plus, um, but there is the one, if I can push that out there, I've got uh, ALF 101 on top of FUML 1.1, one, one. I just need to package it up for release. Also work going on on ALF for uh, Pyrus Eclipse UML tool. Um, so that's an open source UML tool in Eclipse. Um, we actually have demonstrated at the last OMG meeting the ability to actually specify an activity within Pyrus in ALF, compile it and execute it using their FUML engine within Papyrus. Um, and that's still an ongoing activity that hasn't been widely released yet, but it is an, an ongoing activity. I also happen to know that IBM has at least two efforts working on ALF. I'm talking to the Rhapsody folks, I've been hearing from them a lot. So Rhapsody will, I can't, quote, don't quote me on that. I will deny, <laughs> deny it, but, but, but um, push them. Um, IBM was a co-submitter on ALF, so uh, they were pushed into this, by the way. They, they were perfectly happy in supporting their customers on just merging C++ or Java. So. The community uses Java, RSA, the Rational Software Architect, has the capability of um, you know, having snippets of Java in it and generating out Java code. And Rhapsody was more the C++ community, it wasn't entirely more the C++ community. They're perfectly happy just supporting that. Some of their customers, big customers, Ericsson, publicly came out and said, we want to move away from this disconnect of having the executable UML model and then having to put C++ in. We want an action line. So IBM said, sure, we'll create you an action line. And they said, no, our culture, our, our corporate policy is it has to be a standard. So they pushed IBM to be part of the standard. And of course, everybody else wanted to go a little bit further than IBM. So uh, IBM is, is maybe not as far along as some, but, but they are moving. Um, and the Rhapsody folks, um, that's what uh, Ericsson is using. So they are, they are definitely moving with Rhapsody. And they already have a UAL, which is not quite ALF compliant yet, but a, a UML action language in, in current release of Rational Software Architect. Um, so that's work that is currently ongoing. 
uh, implementations and, and other ongoing work includes uh, UML version 1.2, which will add some additional UML capabilities. One of the things we didn't put in FUML was handling of exceptions. Um, we thought we could get away with that on a higher level. It turns out we really can't get away with it because people are used to using it. Let's go ahead and put it three. Uh, so, yeah. So, out version 1.1 1 .1 is coming. This is the interesting stuff. This is building, really building cementally on the foundation. So there is an RFP out, and there's been an initial submission or by submission coming on the precise semantics of UML composite structure. This is basically components and parts and ports and connectors. Um, and it is necessary for the real, it makes with the real time folks, um, Marte is, is the UML profile, and the SysML folks. Both of those need componentized uh, models with components. In there. Um, ports and interfaces and connectors to separate things out, the uh, basic block model. And but the, the problem, okay, there's a problem here, right? Because the UML, mm, you know what it's called today, I think how this can be very well done in the next two to five years. This ML will still have, have chaos because if you're going to do comp composition of components in this ML, you have to tackle the difficult problem yep. of what you're going to do with the requirements of parametric diagrams. Right. And we're not, all right, so this is a step. Again, you can't tackle that until you've worked out. The problem is that the underlying components of the work going on people are complaining because that's I know. the need for system engineering. I know. And, and it's going to create another chaos. Yep. I know. Which is why we're trying to move on this. Yeah. Why this actually went ahead of state machines. It will help the, yeah. the software part of it. Well, it'll help the system engineering part of it too if you want to make it consistent. Yeah. So, what we basically have coming out of this is that there will be a normative, precise match UML components, and composite structure, and parts, which is a mess right now. I mean, it's worse than the other parts of UML. Is it going to, um, is it going to really address uh, issues of composition and composition? Yes. It, yes, to the extent that we can agree on that in UML. Okay. It will not be as sophisticated as some people would like, and that's just because the whole idea of what composition is and, and whatnot, so it'll be relatively simple. In, in terms of what it could be. I mean, we, we, we're not going to go beyond what's there in UML, but we're going to take what's there in UML and say we're going to make that precise. Um, and where it wasn't precise, where there are multiple options, we'll either say the precise semantics is just that option, or there'll be a precise way to say it. There will also be non-normative um, extensions to support parts of Marte and SysML. So we will start showing how Marte and SysML could be built on that, but it's really up to, say, the SysML community to decide how they're going to deal with some of the issues you're talking about. And I know there are people who are going around this because UML is so messed up. We're trying desperately to catch up <laughs> so we can at least provide a foundation so there can be commonality rather than SysML trying to do it one way, Marte doing it in another way. The, the other area is the uh, service-oriented architecture folks doing it in another way. We want to, again, try to make that common basis because people right now are making different assumptions. Um, because the UML spec in this area is so imprecise. Um, but other things uh, is to create additional, so this is primarily structural, it's the semantics of how to deal with structure and, uh, and composition, but there's more behavioral stuff, uh, state machines, interactions, and complete activities process model. And I really expect, expected the next RFP to be state machines, but um, composite structure basically jumped that largely because of pressure from both the real time and system elements. But I, I expect those to come, but there's only a limited bandwidth for people to work on this stuff to attempt to be a common community of people. So that uh, is the end. Thank you. There's going to be a tie, uh, the usual, like a round table at 2 o'clock, right? That's going to be at 2168. And you're welcome to come. We well, should have a lot more. I expect several of you to come because there are a lot of people here that this is a uh, burning interest. Uh, but we have time for a couple of questions if you want to join. Anybody else in the back who hasn't had a chance to uh, ask? These are all pretty easy students working with us. I mean, the hardcore of them. Okay. Does it make any sense? So the, the question I will ask you is this then, which was at the heart of your answer. And, uh, is that I believe that the uh, UML uh, and the current developments are very encouraging for the software side of systems engineering. Uh, 
system side and the systems engineering, I don't have the same expectations. In other words, I will, despite that, a lot of people, I will not uh, insist on correcting the speed of our models for system error as I would for EML, for, for the reason that I just explained. Any comments on that? Because you seem to imply the, in the absolutely the opposite. Uh, interestingly enough, that I, I am I have a system engineering background, but I work primarily in software now. Right. So for what I'm doing now, if we get nothing else than better software out of this, that serves my purpose. Absolutely. But, but the interesting thing is it's been a real uphill battle to get people out of the mindset that came from OOAD and early UML to the idea of executable models, which is why Schler Miller approach had been largely sidelined. One of the things that really helped push even software people to see that models could be more than just pictures was the system L folks. Because they came from the idea of system engineering, where the system engineers were much more familiar with models that actually had meaning, whether they were executable or analyzable. The idea that now they had system L but couldn't get executability out of it or simulatability or even have a precise semantic. They're not the same. I, I know they're not the same. But any of those things was much, from the point of view of most software people, your ML was pictures and the code was what ran. And the idea that those pictures had a semantics and then the code had to conform to that semantic rather than the, you know, rather than the, than the model just being a model of the code, that was hard for a lot of people to get their head around. But the SysML community coming into OMG pushed this idea that models mean something in and of themselves. Um, and that helped push the software community. Now there's still folks in the SysML community would very much like to get that executability. Um, whether that's going to happen, whether that work can continue, I think you're right, that might be up for debate. I certainly think that it would be useful to be able to model something in system out, execute and get a good simulation out of it. Simulation, I agree, but the simulation um, formally is different. Well, if you get a simulation that has to reflect reality enough that you can make conclusions from it in your ongoing and analysis. Of that, I have another question. Uh, there are at least two people in the room namely the fellow behind Steve, okay? Uh, every bit for us, okay, and yeah. where Brian? Yeah. Brian, okay. We are working on uh, model-based system engineering for things that they are principally software systems, namely sensor networks right. and protocols for wireless networks, where the hardware component is very small. And some of the developments in, in UML are of central importance for these two uh, works because uh, primarily what we're trying to do is to break down various pieces of very large pieces of software or other things that describe the software in a way that can at least address uh, software hardware for design in a streaming yeah. setting. The question then is this, to what extent in the discussions of UML proper, people have raised the question, which is an open question, how do we link this wonderful software model that's called which have composition and all that stuff, to performance models? Of, of this software on bias platforms because what we care about in both projects and why these projects are about is we care about things you know how fast your software will execute, yeah. how many packets you're gonna lose into the communication, yeah. and these things like that. And these are you I'll show you a diagram you have here and now it says there's another block. You have formal models, executable models, and then you have another block that's called about performance models. And and we have looked and looked and looked and there are very few works, there even are. in software proper that they link this to. Any comment on that? There was some work that was done a few years ago. Um, picture that case, but I can't remember his name. Um, there was some work that was done specifically on performance modeling for software, tying that model based development for software. That did not, it, 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 I, it was popular for a while, but it didn't really take off, unfortunately. Um, there is, in the real-time community, the uh, interest in how Both to, of his products have yeah. that part. So there is a lot of interest in like, the Marte community about how to annotate a model with real-time constraints and then show whether or not it's able to meet those constraints. Um, in FUML, we intentionally did not take on the detail of time semantic necessarily do that. I actually did, for Sandy Friedman, saw some additional study about how that could be extended. So that's still somewhat of an open question, but the idea would be to build um, a better time model on top of something like FUML and then formalize what it means to place restrictions on top of your model um, and say, what does it mean to execute? If, if I have an execution semantics, can I say what it semantically means for it to meet or not meet the timing constraints? So there's only one kind of performance, but specifically the timing constraints. And there is a way to notate those in UML, even though it's 
be better. So there has been some work on that. I know the real-time folks are much more, they have a much more sophisticated time model and, and modeling capability. Um, and so it's all Pardon? And so it's all Yes. Um, so yeah. there's not as much work on that as one would hope there's to another, see. There's some there's people thinking about it. A lot of different papers that I want to throw in discussion since this is being recorded to get that. You work with the regulation, okay? We are developing formal models of these protocols and the hardware that we run on. Right for the purposes of analyzing the security of the system. Yes. So there is this connection that if this finishes and you have truly formal models of UML, even for software, you will hopefully do analysis of vulnerabilities and so on with formal means. That's right. And that is a very vast area of application. Yes. I do not know if one is aware of that. I don't, uh, some people are. So there's a whole software assurance group within OMG, and I've done some work with those folks. We did some SDIR work. Um, and uh, my former boss, Corey Castaneda, uh, we're trying to bring that together with the modeling approach. This whole idea of, you know, with software, especially if you're evolving a system, um, as you start evolving it and distributing it and whatnot, your security footprint grows, right? The things you need to deal with and the threats deal with. Well, Suppose you could specify the system in an executable model, and you could prove formally the security properties of that, and then you didn't manually, you, you automatically distributed it out, and you showed that those... There are huge efforts in this direction, one from DARPA, one from NSF, one from NSA. I don't know if you come into the high insurance software workshop in uh, Annapolis later this month. No, I don't But there are some discussions, things. but they don't follow this. Right. They go within a specific language and a particular compiler, a particular implementation, and try to analyze. What we've been trying to do is get people interested in right. saying, well, can we take that level up? Right. Um, now, people are saying, well, how do you know that that's all going to be correct? Or will it introduce Trojans? Or what? It's like, well, yes, but that's also happening in software. Right? It's, 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 not, it's, it's actually harder to prove the correctness once you've gotten down to the implementation level. There's a change of mentality at yes. higher levels here that if one has formal models, it would be possible to get a lot done by formal automated ways and not the way right. done right now. Because right now, the state of affairs in many of the systems is you, you put things together by software and then you get a very competent red team. If they can break right. it, you, it's not secure. If they cannot break it, it's secure. And then you ask the patient until when. Right. So there is an enormous uh, re emphasis on trying to build. Right. What, I, what I see is, is it's the same problem you have trying to test quality of something. You can't test security right. into it. Right. That needs to be from the beginning. And we haven't had the tooling. It's like in the agile approach where you start at the beginning and you say, I'm going to make sure that when I get to the end, any defects I've known about are out. I don't deliver it with defects. I don't want defects found after the fact. It's the same thing with security. Yeah. Right? Any weaknesses, I want to find those out in the beginning. Fix them in the fundamental creation of the software. Now, nobody's going to be perfect, but the idea is not to put it out there and then try to. So there is there's there's two, the two series efforts funded, and then a smaller one by DARPA uh, that they think what's called the science of security and people yeah. trying to address this notion of if I had formal models, I could do better analysis, I could link it to security, proof of not composition and so on so forth. So hopefully, because people uh, basically don't see any other way, I mean, this method of uh, putting things together and let uh, people try uh, a teaming or until an attack happens, uh, it doesn't win in the end, right? So it does. And, and, and there are there are significant software out there that, that has significant flaws in it, right. um, including you know Bind and all sorts of underlying internet software um, that, that has real issues because of that. Um, and, and we have shown here twice and another group California saw that if you had foreign models for some of the systems, you could do such a better job in, in analyzing, even finding new attacks or even certifying right. something and saying as far as these particular types of attacks, the particular thing is that you can get them. You can, get, you can get a much higher level. So that's a whole other reason why we're interested in just software alone and not necessarily systems yeah. engineering, right? So, you know, we, we have our user system engineering system, SML, but even the UML, if the developments we're describing happen, they will be very useful to many of us here. A lot of it is just getting people to fund and, and to focus the funding on, on doing that, and there are also often a lot of other things. Okay. Um, there's a company out in uh, California, Object Security, that also does um, model-based security for distributed systems. Yeah, that's a nice yeah, any other questions? Okay.
Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I hope I